So welcome to the second panel, uh, Filming and Performing Otherness of our roundtable series on diversity and decolonization in Italian studies. And thank you so much for being here uh, today. I would like to thank all speakers uh, for accepting our invitation and all of you for attending. My name is uh, Simone Brioni. I am Associate Professor in the Department of English at Stony Brook University. I'm currently a visiting professor at uh, Università di Roma, La Sapienza. This roundtable series uh, was uh, organized in collaboration with uh, Marie Orton, Graziella Parati, and Gao and Zhang. Uh, this roundtable series was, was made possible uh, thanks to the generous contribution of the College of Humanities and Brigham Young and uh, the Leslie Center for the Humanities uh, at Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, it was organized uh, uh, thanks to uh, Matthew Green, who also provided uh, uh, his expert uh, help uh, uh, with uh, uh, all the technical um, problems that we have uh, encountered uh, and also uh, provided us with insightful inputs. We have such a rich uh, panel on diversity today and uh, who is the chair, uh, a white, uh, heterosexual, able-bodied, uh, cisgender, northern, Italian guy. I'm not a member of a discriminated mi minority, but one of the reasons to organize this roundtable is to rethink the way we do research, reflecting upon the power relationships that are involved in our research and teaching activities, and changing the status quo to create a more inclusive environment, uh, which I believe can be revitalizing for the our field of study, whatever field of study we feel we belong to, and beneficial to the society in which we live or in which we would like uh, to live. This is the reason why we have decided to further continue our collective conversation uh, in a special issue of the Journal of Italian Studies in Southern Africa, which will be published in 2022. And, uh, so I just would like to remind uh, once again to mute your microphones and to encourage you to send you questions to me uh, uh, and to uh, in the chat. The Q&A session will be after uh, the presentations have concluded. And thank you again for being here today. I will start by introducing our first uh, uh, speaker, uh, Matteo Dutto. Matteo Dutto is an adjunct research fellow at Monash University in the School of Languages, Literature, Cultures and Linguistics. His research explores how cultural producers collaborate with indigenous, migrant and multi-ethnic communities to produce transmedia and transcultural counter-narratives about belonging and identity. His first monograph, Legacies of Indigenous Resistance, was published in 2019 as part of the Australian Studies Interdisciplinary Perspective series. Uh, and uh, Matteo will present on decolonizing migrant uh, heritage. Matteo, I leave it to you. Thanks, Simone. And thanks to the organizing team uh, for having me. I'll just share my screen. You should be able to see it now. Excellent. And uh, yeah, I would like to start by acknowledging the sovereign custodians of the land on which this uh, research project started uh, almost three years ago, the Wurundjeri and Bumburum people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elder past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. The work that I'm presenting today emerges from a collaborative effort that over the past three years has brought together a growing number of scholars. So far, we have published a call for the piece in Alta Italia, presented our work at numerous conferences, including the Diaspora Italiana series that Anthony Tamburri will be discussing further on May 11th during this series. And we are currently working on a special issue for Australian Historical Studies Journal. All of this wouldn't have been possible without the efforts of Dr. Francesco Ricatti from Monash University, who has played a vital role in bringing us together and in encouraging exchange between researchers that work across a number of different disciplines. Before I start, I also want to thank Joseph Pugliese and Maria Palotta Chiaroli for their contribution to this larger collaborative project and for their support to my own work. My piece in this collective effort uh, mostly concerns the history of Italian migration cinema in Australia, and this is what I will be focusing on uh, today. 
Now, stories of encounters between Italian migrants and indigenous Australians have rarely been portrayed in film and documentary form by either Italian or Australian filmmakers, reflecting a lack of interest that is not incidental, but as I've argued elsewhere, should be better understood as constitutive to how migrants' sense of belonging and identity is negotiated in contemporary Australia. And this is something that Alan Courfois has noted but debates on national identity and belonging in Australia are often structured along two separate lines of research. One focusing on the relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous people and Australia's history of dispossession and persisting colonialism. And another one concentrating instead on migrant sense of identity, multiculturalism, and ultimately on the position on, of non-Anglo migrants within Australian society and their own sense of belonging. It's the separation between indigenous and migrant history that is indeed an enduring aspect of Australian historiography. Reflecting on how settler colonial theory has become a key framework to approach the past and present history of former colonies where indigenous people continue to be marginalized and denied sovereignty, the indigenous scholar Shina Konishi has very recently argued that the settler native binary, which sits at the heart of settler colonial studies, fails to acknowledge and engage with what she identifies as the long histories of entanglement between indigenous people and non-Anglo migrants. In doing so, Konishi advocates for a deeper and more complex engagement with local histories of indigenous resurgence and resistance to colonialism, one that recognizes the agency and diversity of indigenous people and identities, as well as the rich network of connections that they form with country, culture, kin, and newcomers. Approaching the same binary divisions from the perspective of Italian migration studies, scholars such as Francesco Ricatti and Joseph Pugliese have long advocated for the need to decolonize migrant historiographies, recognizing how the complex history of encounters between non-Anglo migrants and indigenous Australians has reinforced settler colonial practices with migrants benefiting and being complicit with the settler colonial project or instead, on the opposite end of the spectrum, resisted them with stories of dissent and collaboration that offer new decolonizing models of transcultural belonging and dialogue. And I won't have time to discuss this story in detail today, but an example of this story of dissent is the story of Clearly Yumbulu Koyat, a migrant from Trieste who migrated to Australia in the 70s and uh, is now living in Kaliwinko in the Northern Territory. She has married uh, the Waramiri man Terry Yumbulul, and she identifies as Triestine and Waramiri rather than Italian and Australian. So different approaches to how identity is negotiated. Now, when it comes to documentaries and to the visual heritage of migration, Italian and Italo-Australian films and documentaries on the lives of Italian migrants have often represented exclusively the, the relationships between Italian migrants and the Anglo-Celtic settlers, focusing on migrants' own sense of identity and belonging. And as I've argued before, the few existing on-screen representations of encounters between Italian migrants and indigenous Australians were, however, of critical importance in popularizing dominant settler colonial ideologies and stereotypes amongst both Italian and Australian audiences. Still, since the early 70s, Italian and Italo-Australian filmmakers have established prolific relations with indigenous communities and cultural producers, collaborating on projects that focus on indigenous histories and cultures rather than on Italians' migrants' experiences in an attempt to decolonize settler colonial historiographies through indigenous epistemologies and representation strategies. The connections that Italian and indigenous cinema share in Australia can be first traced back to Alessandro Cavadini's 1972 documentary in Inglana and extend through the work of Italo-Australian director Fred Scapisi with uh, Murungung actor Tommy Lewis on The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, a film that was released in 1978, the work of producer-director Rosa Colosimo on the TV documentary series Women on the Sun, which was released in 1981, and this collaboration's rich ongoing work of director cinematographer Fabio Cavadini that you see in the picture here, 
with indigenous producer and directors such as Gedry and Jarwil Huzan, Larissa Berend and Jason DeSantelo, as well as the work in digital storytelling of third and fourth generation Italo-Australian directors such as Vincent Lamberti, which we'll be discussing towards the end. But I want to spend some time with uh, about an Inglana because this is a film that I'm currently working on at the moment. And Inglana is a documentary on the history of the embassy protest, the 10th embassy protest and of the land rights movement in Australia, which was realized in 1972 by Alessandro Cavadini, whom you see in the picture here on the right. And it's a film that was realized in collaboration with the indigenous activists of the 10th embassy and of Redfern in Sydney. And it truly, it was amongst the first to represent indigenous people, not as ethnographic subjects, but as creative agents of political change and as the ones at the forefront of change in Australia in the early 70s. It's a film that was described by the indigenous historian and activist Gary Foley as the single most important film on the Aboriginal political struggle in the last 50 years. And Ninglana provides a unique insider view into the history of the 10th Embassy protest and continues to this day to play a crucial role for the ongoing struggle for Indigenous sovereignty in Australia, often being screened by Indigenous activists at international debates and conferences. But whereas the film and its legacy remain to this day a crucial component of the ongoing fight for Indigenous sovereignty and decolonization in Australia and overseas, little attention continues to be paid to it by migrant organizations and by scholars of Italian migration. As I mentioned before, Ninglana is a film that has circulated widely across the world. And just to give you an idea of the reach that this film has had, the images that you see here were taken during the first visit of nine indigenous activists to China on October 1972, where they toured the country acting as ambassadors of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy and advocating for indigenous land rights and self-determination. The visit to China, for those of you who are familiar with Australian history, came at a time in which Australia still did not recognize the PRC and was thus a critical component of the transnational communication strategies developed by the indigenous activists to embarrass the Australian government on the international stage. The Australian Security Intelligence Organization, ASIO, and the Australian government showed an active interest in the visit, harassing and threatening members of the delegation to prevent them from leaving Australia. And the efforts of ASIO were not aimed only at stopping them from leaving, but also at preventing them from taking out of the country in Inglana, the film that Cavadini realized. And the image of Cavadini that you see here on the left was taken by an ASIO agent, a secret service agent, on the day the delegation left. The delegation was still able to take the film out of the country, stating that it was a cultural film, and it was shown to thousands of Chinese students, party officials, and the general public, first in the Great Hall of People in Beijing, and then across the country, playing a critical role in garnering international political support and in condemning Australian racial policies in the eye of the world. Cavadini also collaborated with indigenous activists to screen the film in remote communities across Australia, in schools, in university, and Inglana had its first international screening in Europe at the 1973 Festival dei Popoli here in Florence. But when I was speaking with Alessandro about his efforts to organize screenings of Inglana, he also noted how he felt an overall sense of detachment when addressing issues of indigenous sovereignty and land rights with the Italian audience in Sydney in the 70s and 80s. Sorry, and you had... have 30 seconds to wrap up. Whoa. And he attributes this to what he calls a, the, a cultural gap that was very hard to fill. And to this day, it's, this is a film that has rarely been screened by migration museums and by Italian migrant association. And I think this connects uh, to what uh, we were discussing also yesterday with Paolo Frasca. And I agree with him that the way in which we can move beyond uh, the usual narratives of migration, the narratives of struggle and success, and to start decolonizing the history of Italian migration to Australia and to other settled colonial countries, is to work collaboratively with indigenous activists and scholars in discussions of land rights and sovereignty by promoting stories of dissent and activism like those of Ninglana and Alessandro in our own research and teaching practices. 
and recognizing and reconceptualizing these films uh, as uh, both a key moment in the history of indigenous activism, but also as an integral facet of the visual heritage of migration in Australia, focusing our attention not only on the on-screen representations of uh, stories of migration, but also on the collaborations that occurred behind the camera and are still going on behind the camera, collaborations between Italian filmmakers and indigenous activists. And I'll leave you with this because my time is over, I think. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll stop Matteo. the share screen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matteo, for such a, an interesting presentation. And our second speaker is Vetri Nathan, uh, who is associate, associate professor and leads uh, the Italian Studies program in the Department of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His research and teaching interests include immigrant cultures and globalization in contemporary Italy, European colonialism and post-coloniality, Italian cinema and global food studies. His first book, Marvelous Body, uh, but is Italy's new migrant cinema was the first monograph to be published uh, on uh, the subject, uh, on, on, on this subject. So, Vetri. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the invite. Great to see again, uh, so many wonderful names and faces here. Um, I uh, hope to be relatively quick because, uh, oops, uh, there we go. Um, I am really looking forward to listening uh, more than uh, more than talking uh, today. Uh, but um, I wanted to start with a quick image um, of the Italian uh, national relay team uh, that won the gold medal for Italy in the Mediterranean games in 2018. And uh, they were bronze medal winners in the, in the world athletics final in 2019. Um, and of course this was, um, really a striking image uh, and um, I wanted to kind of give my contribution to this panel that looks at uh, some specific examples of performing or, or, or cinema sometimes in particular and maybe use that definition of viewing and vision a little bit more broadly some, and sometimes even metaphorically. Um, of course this image and this vision of representation of the Italian nation um, is, I think, the way forward. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit about, um, about that, but it, it all comes down to, um, and I might sound like a broken record to some of you who have listened to, uh, to me talk previously. Um, I tend to talk a lot about Homi Baba and his understanding of hybridity um, which is, I think, in striking contrast to uh, uh, more normative notions of multiculturalism and diversity. Um, in, for this specific panel, uh, I love how Baba focuses on what he calls the regime of visibility, uh, you know, what we view or what we see as the nation. And uh, I think um, it's very exciting to see um, the field of cinema studies, media studies in general, um, and in today's world of digital social media, uh, looking at that regime of visibility and questioning it. Um, and a quick um, kind of understanding of Baba's um, view of the regime of visibility, he specifically mentions it as one of the mechanisms of hybridity, and it's the part where identities are fixed. Uh, specifically through the stereotype is fetish. Uh, I'll just quickly read uh, a, a short quote from Location of Culture. Uh, he says, it is through this notion of splitting and multiple belief that I believe it becomes easier to see the bind of knowledge and fantasy, power and pleasure that informs the particular regime of visibility deployed in colonial discourse. And I think uh, we've gone beyond post-colonial studies uh, being specifically interested in the colonial relationship, um, but looking at uh, a lot of other power relationships in a transnational uh, world today. Uh, so he says, continuing with the quote, uh, the visibility of the racial colonial other, and since this panel is about otherness, is at 
once the point of identity, and he quotes Fanon by saying, look, a Negro, um, because that is the point of identity, the point of this, uh, the location of the stereotype, and in the same time, a problem for the attempted closure within the discourse. So he, he actually mentions the stereotype as both the point where identities are fixed, but also that kind of instable location where the identity also tends to slip. Um, and I kind of mention it in terms of um, Italian studies because we look at non-white and non-normative bodies and they're viewed perpetually in arrival. And that's, that image kind of gives you an example of that, that, that view. Uh, you know, they're perpetual newcomers and transgressors. Um, and I think that view can be uh, successfully countered by this vision uh, of a different view of Italian nationhood, uh, especially with a, I think it's interesting with a black and white photo of Italian migrants, of course, arriving on the shores of the new world, uh, it's very hard to locate uh, and fix identity. And so kind of pairing these two images makes it, I think, a very interesting um, combination um, for me. Um, and I actually am, am learning so much from everyone else. These are, I guess, suggestions to myself more than for other people. But I think there are so many paths to understanding this regime of visibility. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, we just got um, an example of that, um, of how to contrast that regime of visibility by, uh, by uh, Signor Dutto in the previous presentation. Uh, so I'm, this is kind of just great and so inspirational. Uh, so why Baba's hybridity? I think um, it's the second quote, why I'm interested in it. And I kind of sound like a broken record sometimes is because I think a lot of uh, new Italians who might not look Italian or who might not have many, a hybrid uh, perhaps background. I was just speaking to the rapper Amir Issa uh, a, a week ago and he, just finds it so hard because every time he's called an Italo Egiziano or a, an Italian migrant artist, and he he would love to be just called an Italian uh, hip hop and rap artist. So I think Baba is interesting because in effect, this is the second quote, uh, strikes at the heart of underlying notions that form the basis um, of this idealized liberal idea uh, of both nationhood and multiculturalism. Um, and this is from Andrew Smith, that rely on the assumption that there were primeval, separate and distinct global cultural orders, which are only now beginning to meet in the context of global migration or whatever it might be. So this idea of seeing uh, these bodies as perpetual newcomers, uh, I think there is, is something to be countered with. Um, so I think hybridity with Baba is interesting because for him, he's looking at this as a as a as a as, as identities in motion, uh, he fuses colonizer and colonized, or self and other, uh, into this neutral term as colonial subject because they're constantly in this kind of fluid relationship, and it's their slip that interests me more. The slip between the two, um, and that centrality of ambivalence, right? His famous third space where culture works is within that slip. Um, I'm going to finish up with this really interesting uh, image of uh, a, the one of the election campaigns of Fratelli d'Italia, and you know we are seeing um, these effects of the regime of visibility on actual bodies, right? Um, so that is, I think, important to note, um, and um, not on, and the intersectionality comes in this poster on the right where I think it, I find it very interesting if you, I'm, I'm analyzing kind of Georgia Meloni's political discourse in her speeches. Uh, it's very interesting how she slips constantly from speaking about immigration and race to gender issues. And it comes down to this interest that I think uh, Robert J.C. Young mentions, this kind of obsession with biology and reproduction and, and they kind of slip into each other that intersectionality uh, the poster, of course, speaks about let's stop, um, you know, teaching in the wrong way in schools, no to a gender education in schools. What is interesting is this was a huge um, 
slip in itself because the poster, the image that was used was of a, a boy named Alex Elliott, a boy, uh, a boy identifies as, uh, as transgendered, so uh, is transitioning, uh, photographed by a student, Rose Morelli, who was making this uh, uh, photographic project in response to Leela Alcott's suicide in Ohio in 2015. And she killed herself because her fundamentalist Christian parents would not allow her to, uh, would, did not accept her identity as transgender. One of the big laws of non-conversion camps in Ohio was named after Leela Alcott after this, um, after this tragedy. So they have used a, a project that was speaking for uh, a, a more fluid understanding of gender identity to actually go against that very educate that the education of gender um, questions in in Italian schools, but I find this pairing very interesting, and I'm looking at that intersectionality uh, of race, of reproduction, and of biology more closely as I go move forward. So I'm going back to where I began with the image. Uh, how can we disrupt this more static view of Italy? And I have. Here are colleagues who are really teaching me how to do that. So I don't really have to uh, mention this, but I guess this is kind of one of my own personal um, agendas moving forward is making those transnational connections explicit. Uh, and I'm using this quote from the previous presentation by Mr. Dutto, making explicit those long histories of entanglement, right? You just mentioned that. Um, so, uh, I think that is uh, one of the interesting ways forward that is non-pedantic and um, highlighting the hybridity within, uh, which Italy is one of the most interesting examples of that, um, specifying, but also going beyond specific identity politics. Um, I recall Steve Bannon uh, and his very interesting quote saying, uh, as long as, the Democrats play on identity politics, we are always gonna win, Steve Bannon had said, which I thought was very interesting um, kind of comment. And it's kind of a question as academics and academia are being questioned increasingly about their focus on specific identities compared to others and that pushback we're all facing in the classrooms. I myself, while teaching Italian American migration cultures, had quite strong pushback from a few students saying, why are you focusing on these aspects of, of relationships between Italian Americans and black Americans, for example? Um, you know, Sorry, you have 30 seconds to wrap up. Thank you, Graziella. Uh, so that kind of pushback, how do we look at it in very interesting ways where hybridity is focused on rather than intersectionality? And then the question I'm asking myself is, is it time to move beyond the Italian studies major? And that I guess is a provocazione I'm launching out. I'm really interested to know what people think. Can we, should we be more um, inserting Italian studies within a global studies framework, a Mediterranean studies framework? These are questions that will be asked by other panelists too um, in this round table. So thank you very much and look forward to listening to all the other participants. Thank you so much, Vetri, uh, for this fantastic presentation. And uh, I would like to remind everybody uh, to send questions to me in the chat uh, for the Q&A session uh, after all the presentations have concluded. And um, our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, uh, Shalene Green. Shalene Green is uh, an associate professor of cinema and media studies in the Department of Film, Television and Digital Media at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research interests include Italian cinema, Black European studies and post-colonial studies. Her book, Equivocal Subject um, between Italy and uh, Africa, and Italy and Africa, Construction of Racial and National Identity in the Italian Cinema, examines the representation of mixed race subject of Italian and African descent in the Italian cinema. And she will be presenting about the colonizing Italian cinema. Shalini. Hello, good afternoon and good morning um, to everyone. Um, thank you for this kind invitation. 
uh, to join uh, this uh, very relevant and timely conversation. Um, it's also a pleasure, um, as always, to hear new work um, uh, that is being explored by everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, share screen and um, just read uh, from some prepared notes on a project that I've been working on um, over time uh, and uh, is part of a recent uh, publication um, that I will be uh, that will be coming out shortly. And so I will begin by saying, I think um, in my recent work, I've been thinking about the concept of archival retrieval as a process of conducting research in archives that deny or make difficult access to documents for areas of study, in this case, the presence of African descent subjects in Italy. Of course, this is not a new endeavor. A great body of scholarship is now devoted to examining the presence of African descent people who have appeared in the Italian cinema, including new digital archives devoted to documenting those who remained nameless and uncredited. This work is indispensable, and for all the reasons many of us speak today, it is because we are concerned with retrieving these narratives in order to create another trajectory for our present moment and our possible future. Uh, like many scholars in the field of Italian studies, I've been turning to the work of Black feminist scholars as a means to navigate these archives. Take, for instance, Miriam an actor in the 1962 film, Violenza Secreta. The film, directed by Giorgio Moser and based on the novel by Enrico Emanuele, tells the story of Enrico, a primate dealer working in Somalia towards the end of Italian trusteeship. Enrico becomes obsessed with Miriam, a young Somali woman in the service of Farnetti, a plantation owner and a fascist. As his obsession grows, Enrico becomes estranged from his sometimes partner, the British Elizabeth, and his friend Contardi, also a fascist, and who has been excluded from the Italian community because of his homosexuality. Through Contardi's suicide, Enrico is finally made to confront his own complicity in the violence of colonialism. And this uh, is uh, baiting pretty much uh, how I wrote about this film uh, when I first encountered it um, during my first uh, writing of my first book. While Violenza Segreta stands as one of the few films to confront directly Italy's colonial legacy, it also perpetuates the absences of the archive in the erasure of the actor who portrays Miriam. In the press and reviews for the film, she is known as Miriam. Upon further searching, I located a small collection of photographs from the film's production in the Luce Institute's Fondo Dial Digital Holdings. The photographs document a series of scene studies for the film, mostly for scenes between Enrico and Miriam. The photographs are variously titled Scene from the Film Violent Secrets or Enrico and Miriam on the Bed. The photographs feature not the actress who appeared in the final film, but another actor, Joe Garson. As Miriam, Garson appears in cosmetics to make her appear darker, and she is made to wear ethnic costume, something akin to a sari with large beaded earrings and bracelets. As of this writing, I am unable to locate additional information about Garson, or whether or not she was of African descent. I'm not sure what she appears, uh, 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 why she appears uh, rather than the actress who was eventually cast for the role. Was Garson at one point considered for the role or was Garson always a stand-in for the other actor due to her lack of availability? I would imagine this practice is somewhat common in the process of casting for a film but what does become apparent is the process of misremembering, forgetting, and interchangeability of Miriam that takes place in the series of photographs. Miriam is sometimes a generic name for an East African woman commonly used throughout the colonial era. Ironically, in a film that claimed to condone, condemn 
Italian colonialism. The Luce photo series reiterates this form of violence, denying these women their subjecthood and making them infinitely substitutable. I look towards the work of theorist Sadia Hartman and her essay, Venus in Two Acts. Being cautious of the application of Hartman's work, originally applied to the archives of slavery, to the study of Italian cinema. Here, Hartman directs us to the absences in the archive and our desire to fill in the blanks or to quote, recuperate those lost to history, in her case, African woman captives. She states, quote, as a writer committed to telling stories, I have endeavored to represent the lives of the nameless and the forgotten, to reckon with loss, and to respect the limits of what cannot be known. Specifically, my brief inquiries informed by Hartman's argument for retrieving lost histories as a form of ethical redress. In light of the ongoing violence against Black bodies in both Italy and the United States, the contemporary work of African-Italian scholars and artists is also a form of redress. What Hartman defines as the ability to address pain, suffering and loss endured under slavery. As Hartman continues, quote, the limited means of redress available to the enslaved cannot compensate for the enormity of this loss. Instead, redress is itself an articulation of loss and a longing and a reparation. As I prepared another iteration of this talk, I received kindly an article published in Epoca during the film's original release period entitled Miriam, the beautiful Somali girl from the film Settimana Nera. She was a student, a director discovered her. I'll read some of the text from this article. Miriam's audition, I'm sorry, Miriam's audition was a disaster. The girl was so shy, she couldn't look at the camera. But a month of acting school immediately revealed a certain artistic temperament in her. Miriam lived for a long time in Ethiopia. At the age of 17, a scholarship allowed her to study at the University of Naples. But after three years, she moved to Rome, where the director, Moser, discovered her by chance. Shy, reserved, fearful of showing her face in public because everyone turns to look at her but at the same time, very proud of her race. Miriam, an unknown Somali girl, is about to become a film diva. She will play the part of Regina in the film Settimana Nera, which Giorgio Moser based, the novel, based, based upon the novel of Enrico Emanuele. She moved from Naples, where she was studying, to Rome, where the director discovered her by chance. Miriam, who was born in Mogadishu to a Somali mother and an Ethiopian father, has just turned 21 years old. While offering additional information about the actor, the article has the effect of reiterating many colonial stereotypes. And I often pause uh, when encountering such text, is there a way to write beyond the stereotype and engage another history? These retrievals can take the form of collecting documents for the writing of new histories, or in the cases where the archive does not or cannot yield documentation, can be the basis for what Hartman calls a critical fabulation, what she describes as, quote, advancing a series of speculative arguments and exploiting the capacities of the subject subjective, a grammatical mood that expresses doubt, wishes, and possibilities in fashioning a narrative, which is based upon archival research. And by that, I mean a critical reading of the archive that mines the figurative dimensions of history. I intended both to tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling. Um, I've previously written about artists such as Isaac Julian and Kevin Jerome Everson, who have in their practice enacted forms of critical fabulation in their experimental film narratives. In the case of Julian, in his 2008 Western Union Small Boats, he conveys a narrative of Mediterranean migration through the eyes of the migrant by way of a passage through Italian cinematic history. And Everson, in his films Rhinoceros and Rhino, imagines the final days of Alessandro de Medici, the first prince of Florence who was of African descent. 
In particular, rhinoceros and rhino place the early modern prince in present day Florence, imagining the final days before his assassination, but also allowing for a rumination on the contemporary lives of African migrants, who in rhino poignantly tell their stories of traumatic passages through Northern Africa and across the Mediterranean to their present lives in Italy. While the possibility of an oral testimony is not exhausted, Miriam may still be alive, what would a critical fabulation of Miriam's and many other actors' stories look like? What would Sorry, we... 30 seconds to wrap up. Thank you. What would we learn about her parents' histories, of her life as a student in Naples, her course of study? What would it mean to, quote, trace the errant paths and the lines of flight, to, quote, reconstruct the experience of the unknown and retrieve minor lies from oblivion? that of Miriam and so many other actors, not altogether lost, but buried in history. Ultimately, how does one account for these absences in the archive? We can bring to light hidden lies by reframing the analytical tools by which we enter existing archives. As in the work of Julian and Everson, we can enact critical fabulations that render stories of what lives may have been while respecting the impossibility of telling these stories. These aesthetic interventions allow us to critically reimagine our existing archives and to write the histories we need for our survival, both endeavors that bear urgently on the present moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shilin, uh, for such a, an amazing presentation. And um, uh, we can now uh, move to our last uh, uh, speaker, um, Ilya Mutamid. Uh, he's a, an Italian director and actor. His movies uh, uh, include uh, Italian, who was awarded the Special Jury Prizes at the Turin Film Festival in 2017, and a special mention as Best Debut uh, Director for the Nastro d'Argento uh, in, in 2018. And Cufide is the second biographical feature film. Uh, which was selected for the documentary competition at the 38th Turin Film Festival and at the Nastri d'Argento, and it will be distributed in Italy, uh, in Italian movie theater, as, as soon as they will uh, reopen. So, uh, and his presentation is called uh, Cufid, Rethinking Italianita through documentary making. Elia. Hello, hello to everybody. Thank you for uh, this kind invitation. And uh, first of all, I do apologize for my bad English, but I hope to, uh, to be clear. Uh, okay, my name is Elia Mutamid. Uh, I'm Italian. Uh, my origin are coming from Morocco, but I grew up here in Italy and in, in North Italy, because we have to, to do a distinction between North and South. Uh, talking about uh, immigration, uh, Italy is a uh, is a very strange, uh, very strange country. Um, I grew up uh, uh, in, in in a region called uh, Lombardia, um, and um, as as uh, as Simone said, my first movie called Italian. Uh, was um, a, a road movie where I took my father permanently to his country of, uh, of origin in Morocco. So, uh, and during the, that journey, I tell um, the, 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 the talking about the, the, the history of my father, I tried to uh, tell the history of the last 35 years of Italy. Uh, a story where the where father and son discuss uh, when, um, um, like uh, how I can say, my dad's immigrant status uh, in the early '80s was curiosity, and only 30 years later th that status become becomes a problem to be solved. Um, the film therefore tries to investigate the past of my country, so Italy in the perspective of social changes uh, dictated by the immigration. immigration. Talien is a, is a film that thinks about the past, about the memory. 
So two, uh, two years uh, later, I started working with an, uh, with, on another film where the topic, the issue was uh, urbanization and how the urbanization could change humans. Uh, but uh, with the arrival of the pandemic, casually, and uh, I think also magically, I would say, Kufid was born. Kufid is the title of, uh, is, the, is the name of, the, of my second future film. And if I talked uh, with Talien about my father past, with Kufid I talk about my present. My present here in, uh, in this country, in Italy. Kufid uh, is a sort of diary, an autobiographical film, a film, a movie where uh, I use myself as a Guinea pig to understand what, with, what kind of present uh, Italy is experiencing, also talking about immigration. So uh, a movie that doesn't talk about the pandemic, but shot uh, during, the, the, during the pandemic, Kufid, uh, what is Kufid? Kufid is an, uh, is an imaginary friend. I use the COVID as uh, if, we, uh, if uh, he were an imaginary friend to self-analyze my beliefs and especially, especially my weaknesses. Uh, a film shot uh, inside my house, so here. This is one of the frames of uh, this movie. <laughs> and... Um, uh, I've used also many external images, references in Mor uh, turned in Morocco, images that I had shot before the, the pandemic. And um, one of the last scenes of this movie of Kufid reflects on uh, the questions of the second generation of immigrants. But um, actually, I never wanted to understand the meaning of this term, I explain. Uh, or rather, and I'm convinced that if someone is born in a country, he becomes part of this country without necessarily specifying the origin of his parents or grandparents or using the terms second or third or fourth generation. Um, here in Italy, we are crossing the uh, second, second generation and um, the same goes for the term cultural integration. So I asked myself in Kufid, in this movie, um, integrated with what? And especially to who? So um, in the movie, my questions didn't want to be controversial, but to remind us uh, the importance of using words. The words integration, for example, it's of here in Italy, uh, from my point of view, it's often used with two, two, principal, two, two meanings. The first is political. Or you integrate into, a, into the system or you are out. So they use the, um, the word integration as a rigid law. And the second is uh, sociological. So the exchange, uh, the, to, to use the, um, and exchange the culture, so the culture, so. So that means that I give you one thing and you give me another. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of immigration, uh, always from my point of view, Italy, it's a very particular and contract contradictory country, uh, a nation that, has exported a huge number of immigrants in the past, like in USA, for example, and now often finds herself very, very impropriated in managing the reception of immigrants, and also, so, and the consequence was to is to um, uh, see immigrants always like something um, that we have to be to pay attention, to be feared something that caused problems, never something that could give me richness or something like that. Um, there are many, there's many um, talking about uh, my past uh, uh, in cinema. In 2007, I shot a small amateur short 
without any cinema uh, preparation. So something uh, that I produced myself here in, at home. And that short film managed to compete in various film, film festival, in, in international film festival. So it, uh, it was a big surprise for me. And uh, um, I understood two fundamental things. Uh, the power of the language by, by images, so cinema. And second, uh, I understand this important, uh, important law, uh, never make films without an inner need. When, when I understand this, uh, I, I started my, cine uh, my cinematographic academic training to learn the language, so to learn how to use the, the cinema language. And after a series of short films, uh, um, in 2017, uh, I turned uh, Talien uh, and then Kufid. And um, there is many, many, many Italian directors uh, that, uh, who have addressed the issue of integration or immigration. But unfortunately, very few Italian directors with foreign origins have had the opportunity to complete, um, to compete, sorry, to compete with cinema to tell about themselves and the dynamics related to immigration. Uh, immigrants, and especially blacks, born, born in Italy, so Italians and 100% are still seen as an aliens as something far from the imaginary. There is a big, big problem, not of, not of racism for me, but from ignorance and both are dangerous, of course. Um, now I'm speaking in English, in a bad English, I know, but uh, I have an, an, uh, an Italian accent, a, a very particular Italian accent uh, that uh, the Northern Italian recognize. When Italian people uh, uh, read my, sir, my, my name, Mutamid, they connect immediately my name to Arabic and then to Islamic and then to another, uh, other things. But when, when they um, listen to my Italian, they immediately forget everything. And uh, I recognize a sort of um, ignorance I don't know if, if this is the right, the right term and not racism. And uh, uh, in my opinion, the arts are the key, the, especially the cinema. It is something that I discovered in myself, uh, turning my movies. Uh, the images uh, give, uh, give you the truth immediately and uh, mostly give the truth to who didn't know you. So um, it's not all bad I mean, in Italy, talking about immigration, of course, on, uh, on the contrary. I'm picking sorry. up, uh, I'm picking sorry. up. Uh, sorry, please. sorry, you have 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, okay, okay. Um, it's not all bad, uh, on the contrary. I'm picking up a, wind, a, wind of, a wind of change from young people who uh, have foreign origins. And the government, the culture, and the arts are realizing, fortunately, it. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elia. Uh, it was great. And uh, yeah, we have um, 25 minutes for our uh, Q&A uh, session. I will start uh, uh, immediately with um, a question uh, on the decolonial approach this is mostly for Matteo uh, Dutto, but you know it can be extended for you know anyone in the panel who wants to to uh, to intervene. What is the uh, a decolonial approach uh, bringing to the study uh, of films? Well, it's bringing many things. It's not something. It's thanks for the question first. To me, it's a daunting question because it's something that. Is quite why I think Shaleen can also contribute to this. But in the case of migration cinema, it's uh, about bringing a new perspective, one that acknowledges the entanglements of uh, non Anglo migrants within 
settler colonial societies and the rich networks of collaborations that this generated. And it's also moving beyond uh, the idea that migration cinema is something that only directly concerns uh, stories of migration as they are represented on screen, but it's something that can also be looked upon from another perspective, uh, what they call the behind the camera perspective. So migrants, migrant filmmakers collaborating with indigenous filmmakers or collaborating in other industries and stories that are not made apparent on a screen but are told behind and in doing so influence the representation regime because one of the key things that I wasn't able to explain properly in the presentation, one of the key things that Cavadini did with Ninglana through his collaborations with uh, the indigenous activists was also in a way an act of unlearning how to do cinema. So he had to forget what he was taught. Cavadini grew up in um, between Italy and Paris during the 1968 protest. He learned to do cinema there, so he was very much fond of the cinema, the French cinema verite approach. But through his collaboration with indigenous activists, indigenous cultural producers, he slowly changed his approach and you see instances of this in his films. So this is what a decolonization of cinema bring. And for those of you who are interested in this, there is a wonderful project at um, SOAS in London called Decolona Screen Words. And it's an initiative that brings together scholars of film with an interest in decolonization. I can send the link in the chat to everyone. And it's led by an indigenous scholar, Lindy Weduhani, and she has been doing amazing work in, um, in collaboration with indigenous scholars and the media scholars over the past years. And I'm happy to share her work because as I said, it's a huge, question and it's something that my expertise is mostly for the Australian side of it but there's of course the history of Italy's own co colonial project uh, and how that was also linked with uh, the experience of Italian ethnographers in Australia and other experiences. So I'll put the link in the chat for those of you who are interested in learning more about the process of decolonizing film studies because it's a it's a pretty important one and it's a complex issue. Uh, thank you, Matteo. Does anybody want to say something? Uh, yeah. Uh, why hybridity? Uh, this is a question for, for Vetri. Uh, why hybridity in Italian culture is worth exploring if it exists in all world cultures? Is it because Italian studies as a discipline has not yet extensively examined uh, hybridity? You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Now you can hear me. Thank you for that question. Um, I, when I was, uh, when the, the field was initially being looked at um, in, when I was in graduate school, I would see uh, a lot of interest in immigrant writers. And, and of course, I would also see myself categorized as um, as an interesting mix of two cultures when sometimes I was neither or in between. And that led me, that kind of personal um, kind of experience uh, of not wanting to go into categories and noticing that exactly that kind of question that Elia mentioned, right? The integration is very much that, that notion of multiculturalism, whereas you know, you take your culture and you and A plus B equals C, uh, that kind of structure. And, and therefore looking at Baba gave me uh, a way to look at Italy in a different way uh, to kind of uh, maybe undertake a bit of a critical fabulation as Shaleen said, uh, uh, in terms of Italy's past, present and future as a, a bit of a continuation rather than an exception. Uh, or uh, as a, or rather as a new phenomenon. So um, I think it's, it's a useful term um, um, because not just for Italian studies, but for cultural studies in general, because it ends up 
uh, we, uh, I mean, I, I always end up also falling into the trap of trying to talk about uh, uh, the meeting of different cultures as, as uh, reinforcing those kinds of, um, you know, categories that, that we want to kind of dismantle. So, um, uh, therefore, uh, I find that useful, not just for Italian studies, but in general, I think as a connection that Italian studies can make with other processes of hybridity uh, in the Mediterranean region and in, in, in the European context as well. Thank you. If anybody wants to perhaps add something to this question, of course we are open, but yeah. yeah. We have another question, uh, which is, uh, I believe, uh, for Shalin, Catherine, and Leah, of course, from different perspectives, um, about actor reality. You know, you in your papers, uh, uh, you talk about, uh, uh, you know, um, you you, be, you have retraced these stories coming from the past. I'm trying to summarize this long question, uh, but uh, what what is the situation today? Uh, it seems that there are mostly, you know, uh, non-professional actors uh, playing the other, you no? Know? And perhaps uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Elia uh, in his experience uh, as an actor, uh, how, you know, uh, how was his experience uh, playing the part of the other, and if he was able perhaps to, uh, um, to have uh, a role or change the ways in which, uh, uh, you know, that role was originally conceived. Okay. Um, uh, till now, um, the Italian cinema productions, till now, uh, when um, they have to use uh, characters that have to uh, represent the, the foreign people. Uh, they use uh, foreign actors. So not Italian actors grow up in Italy. Um, not, not in all the cases, of course. Um, there are many, many examples, many, many films where, where uh, you see the the character the character of the Arab uh, or the char the character of the the African uh, guy or girl uh, uh, they, they 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 import those actors from 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 France uh, from Spain from Germany and uh, there is a, there is a, there is a many reasons many reasons and uh, not uh, connected with the racist reasons. Um, the problem is that in Italy, the, um, the generation, the adult generation that uh, did uh, um, an academic studies in acting, it's still now not existing. Uh, me, I'm an exception because my parents took me in Italy where, in the 80s where the, and in, in the early 80s, I was the unique, uh, the unique child in, uh, for example, in my school. So um, how I can explain? Uh, now, mm, the, 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 new, the, the new generation, so the, the, the guys that have 18 years, they have now to study how to act, uh, how to direct movies. So I think that in the next 10 years, the situation should completely change. I'm talking about actors. To me, to do to make Italian characters and not uh, immigrant ca characters, so they recognize in uh, my Italian, you in, in using my Italian language, uh, a sort of um, Italian Italians being. Um, I I hope to be answered to your question. 
I don't know if I could speak so much to um, perhaps the current moment. Um, I was alluding to Leonardo's project in my paper, the one that Catherine um, spoke about um, in terms of um, sort of making use of uh, digital um, resources uh, um, as a means of sort of reclaiming um, these uh, uh, uncredited uh, actors. Um, many uh, on that side of Afro, uh, African uh, descent. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I think one of my um, main goals uh, with sort of looking at, you know, maybe Black feminist thought as a kind of decolonial praxis maybe um, is to think about writing um, and how we write about um, uh, certain actors. I mean, there's a canon and, uh, you know, these actors fall outside the canon. So how do we end up writing about them? Um, you know, so I'm thinking more in terms of how they appear within the written text. Um, for instance, if I'm writing about Miriam and I, you know, sort of run up against the wall in terms of finding materials on her, I have to reiterate that wall in my, my text or I end up saying I can't find anything else or I put her in a footnote. Um, and, you know, in a certain sense, we begin to read uh, the, the silences of the archive, um, you know, and it becomes very complex because, you know, it really depends on how, you know, uh, sort of search engines are organized and what kind of materials we have access to. And doing this kind of research was very different 10 years ago or 12 years ago uh, from what it is today. But um, I think that uh, what I'm sort of calling for and sort of looking towards, you know, someone like Hartman is to find a different way of writing. Um, I am very uh, weary of sort of, you know, sort of applying Hartman wholeheartedly to this uh, sort of project, but I think that she does allow us to think quite differently about the ways in which we write about certain actors um, who have appeared within the cinema. And um, I'm sort of looking for ways in which we do not kind of reiterate, you know, sort of the marginalization that has happened um, already. So how do we think through that as scholars um, in terms of, of writing these histories? I think Leonardo's project is one sort of way of doing this. Um, um, but I'm also looking towards, you know, sort of maybe Black feminist praxis as another mode of uh, thinking about uh, working with archives that, um, you know, that are difficult to navigate. Um, not that the material isn't there, they're difficult to navigate, and there are certain reasons for that. Um, uh, so I think it's also about a certain type of way of uh, looking into different areas of Italian, I'm sorry, of film studies, such as production studies. So, you know, I think my turn is also to looking more in terms of how these uh, actors, you know, were uh, sort of found, located, how they entered into the film. Um, so I'm thinking also of these things as well. What I find with someone like um, an actor such as Miriam is that there's a certain narrative. She was discovered by the director and, you know, this is her first film and she was shy, so-called, and then uh, she makes her, her, her debut. Sort of how do I disrupt certain narratives such as this, you know, um, you know, uh, how do we begin to write a different way? So, you know, those are sort of my concerns in terms of um, returning to the actor and, um, you know, uh, it's uh, really great to hear um, a sort of Catherine's approach to thinking about um, acting as well uh, in terms of sort of expanding the scope of how we use um, those archival materials. We have... Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We have one last uh, question, which is open uh, to the panel. Is uh, uh, the idea of uh, otherness uh, still a useful uh, uh, concept uh, to talk about, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the themes that have emerged uh, in today's conversation? Should I go first? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in terms of the of settler colonial studies, uh, yes, it is because the settler colonial project is based on the creation of the other. 
And um, one aspect that I couldn't um, um, develop during the presentation because I ran out of time, but one of the reasons why Cavadini notes uh, uh, how difficult it was for him to engage Italian migrants in Australia with a serious discussion around uh, sovereignty and around land rights and around the disposition of uh, indigenous people is precisely because of this, because um, it's, it's an aspect that Francesco Riccati explains very well in his latest book, Italians in Australia, the position that Italians in Australia occupy within the settled colonial project is something of an in-between because on the one hand, they are the other. They are the ones who were racialized and continue to an extent to be victims of racism. But on the other end, they're also part of the settler colonial project. They benefit from it. They benefit from the dispossession of indigenous people. They benefit from the lack of treaty. And so there is this in-between position that relies on uh, this process of othering. So at least for what concerns uh, migration studies and migration cinema, the process of othering is at, at the very heart of the colonial project. Thank you, Victor. Uh, uh, Matteo, you, you said exactly what I was thinking in terms of, I, I really like this collection of presentations because Yes, the question of the other is always relevant because there will there is that push right um, in terms of um, fetishizing identities um, uh, as self or other. Uh, Catherine, I really enjoyed your presentation because you're looking just as we all were in different ways at in interstitial um, and intermediate identities uh, and how that process works towards. Um, fetishizing or not, and where that that act of fetishize, fetishization slips. And it's those slippages that are really interesting. Uh, Matteo, obviously what you're talking about in your presentation is for that reason, uh, interesting and stimulating is because you are looking at that inst interstitial and in-between status that Italian Australians have. And I'm really interested to know whether they use their position uh, in a, uh, or whether they highlight their in-betweenness uh, through their work at any moment, or do they use it to reinforce uh, their status as the norm, as the white norm? Uh, and as we have seen, of course, with uh, the very complicated uh, racial positioning of Italians in America, it's, it's just fascinating how uh, you know, the, 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 the centuries long process was done uh, many times with this kind of interesting dynamic with black bodies in, in America where, uh, you know, uh, one uh, had citizenship, but did not look white. Uh, the others had this intermediate visibility, but did not have necessarily the linguistic or, or um, um, paper to document, to show that as Ital an Italian immigrant. Um, uh, Elia, your work too, I was just looking at just the, the visual quality of Kufid and a lot of it is about the non-exceptionality of your body and your actions and your status in your own house during the pandemic. So uh, I think uh, what Shalin, you know, speaks about is that um, that kind of uh, retrieval of the interstices uh, is that kind of very interesting project that I, I kind of saw as a thread between all of today's presentations. And, and that is obviously as a response to um, the notions of other that, that, that are so per pervasive that are becoming all the more powerful, I think. I think we're going backwards rather than forwards, to be honest, um, in a lot of discourse. Um, as a reaction to hybridity and an increasing hybridity of, of societies. Thank you, Vitri. Thank you. Thank you so, yeah, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Our time uh, today uh, is over. I would like to thank all the presenter for such an amazing presentation and everyone for attending. Tomorrow's session is called Decolonizing Italian Studies and will be chaired by Graziella Parati 
who has organized this roundtable series with me, Maria Orton and Gao and Zhang. I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and uh, see you uh, tomorrow.